premiere, premiere, premiere. <laughs> well, I mentioned mics are hot. <laughs> premiere. an indie means we buck a system that doesn't want us. To be a fringe filmmaker means we don't do it for them. We do it for ourselves. To be an outlaw on the fringe means we'll die before we fail. Be an outlaw. I am well. How are you? I'm going to say it again. I'm hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit. <laughs> hey, hey, Ken, give me a break, man. I'm, I'm on time 99% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, what's up? And I'm even remembering to go over here to the comments and switch it so I can see. Man, you know, it's funny the stuff you forget when you're away for so long. Fuck Two me. weeks. Damn. Damn. It was three, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Technically three. You were absolutely yeah, correct. Of the holidays and stuff. Yeah. Fucking three weeks is too long. Let's not, let's not be gone three weeks again. Until next December. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess we'll have to see where that falls on the calendar. I've given up the soda. Uh, big moves happening here. So like, just straight whiskey now? Workout, huh? Oh, just straight whiskey now without the soda? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did receive... I did receive my ice sphere mold, so I can now make ice balls. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. You got some pretty oh, big man. balls, my brother. Look, we got people. We got people showing up already. What's up, everybody? Lance, love you. So happy you're here, Ken. Good to see you, brother. Terry, Terry, and I got to meet over the break. We met in person. I was actually in the physical presence of the drone Jesus, <laughs> and it was amazing. Uh, we you had mean snow this guy? that day, and, uh, you know, he parked his car, and he walked over from his car to the house through the snow, and there were no footprints. <laughs> <laughs> My beautiful wife, Rebecca, I love you. You are down at the bar tonight. If anybody's in Lexington, go see her. Uh, have an adult beverage and say hello. Brandon, what's up? Gunny, how are you, brother? Love you. Uh, Ed, Big Ed, how's it going, man? Greg, Wheels, how's it going? Libby, how you doing? Uh, Matt, what's going on? Good to see both of you guys here. And Thank happy you. birthday to Matt. Oh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight for the season six premiere of Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade. Uh, with me, your host, George C. Romero, and with me, as always, is my ever-present and faithful producer extraordinaire, Mr. Joe Ridgely. Uh, Joe, you look a little different. Are you missing something? Maybe some, what is it? Let me look at you. Turn, well, did, you, did you lower your ears? Did I lower my ears? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aware of that surgery. I'll have to look into it. <laughs> you cut a shitload of your hair off. I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that won't be, uh, shown until it grows back out again. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have it in a very small ponytail right now, so nobody can see it. I thought you were going to say I actually have it in a very small jar, like you kept it because you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Man, let's see. We got more people tuning in here. We got more people. JD, what's up? Jennifer, how are you? Jeff, good to see you. First time listener. Uh, what's uh, oh well, I guess that's long time listener, first time caller. But you are a first time listener, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, happy to have you here with us in the Indie Brigade. Hopefully you dig what's going on here. Uh, let's see. 
Who else is here? Is that Smithson Lasers? What? He's, he's got the weirdest screen name. What's up, Sean? Right? Glad to see the <laughs> stitches are out. Glad to see everything's going well with the recovery from your surgery. Um, uh, kickback, not something you want to try to catch. Exactly. <laughs> I'll let you pronounce that one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Deeg. I could be wrong. I'm hey, Deeg. What's up, Deeg? If, if we're wrong, just laugh or something. <laughs> Tammy, what's up? Another first time watcher. This is awesome. We got some we got some new folks here tonight. This Sweet. is great. It only took six seasons. <laughs> <laughs> and again, everybody wonders why I drink on the show. <laughs> uh, I'm hey, not on that sort of diet. <laughs> you know, we figured out we figured out over the break that when we started this, uh, I had a beautifully, beautifully um, naturally colored beard uh and working with joe has turned me great wow if you guys only knew what working with george does to me i mean <laughs> seriously you you would you never imagine george i'm not feeling so well you kind of look like a wizard you look like bizarro me wow <laughs> I don't know, man. I got a new camera with new toys. It's kind of kind of fun. I know. What kind of camera did you get? Uh, I just ended up with the uh, Logitech, you know, one that's 10 years newer than the one I had. <laughs> oh, yeah. Logitech. That's like cauliflower. <laughs> Logitech. Logitech. Whatever. <laughs> uh, for all of our first time uh, listeners, watchers, viewers, for all of our new members of the Indie Brigade, there are a lot of inside jokes that you will eventually catch up on. Uh, I recommend you go back and watch some of our previous seasons. Uh, our mission here is one of a true outlaw uh, in the in the um, fringe in the content creation world. Uh, we talk about a lot of stuff that you can't learn even in film school. We have a lot of amazing people on this show to talk about some stuff um, that uh, you, you know most of the people we have on the show have forgotten more than uh, a lot of us will ever learn. Uh, and we just kind of talk and, and rap about the process of filmmaking, the process of sort of outlaw filmmaking, ways to get around, um, you know, ways to circumvent certain uh, generally widely accepted procedures, uh, ways to make it easier to apologize and ask permission when you're making a movie with no money. Um, and uh, we have a, a hell of a good time. So welcome to the Indie Brigade, everybody. Uh, that's all I got. That's my big welcome. Wow. Fuck. All right. On that note, if you guys also, have blame an Joe. We blame Joe for everything. I should have, I, should, I didn't mean to cut you off, but we blame Joe for everything. So it's hashtag blame Joe. If anything goes wrong in your life, whether it be at the job, at home, uh, absolutely anything, just blame Joe. It's the only message on earth larger than that of the Indie Brigade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now if you failed to catch the latest episode of Drone Cav with our resident drone expert, Terry Gerald, you know, the guy, DJ, the guy who walks on water, apparently, according to George, go over to the YouTube channel, check it out right now, Indie Brigade YouTube channel, he has a new episode on there. And what do we have? This weekend on Sunday, we have the Wagner Wiles with Tyler Shea Cohn. Damien Maffei is going to be on there. Uh, he is, I guess, the good-looking guy on the left and the scary-ass monster on the right. Uh, awesome. Not quite sure what that's from, but somebody out there will. Awesome. Awesome shows. And by the way, I technically said that, that Terry floated over snow. Floated. Okay. I didn't say he walked on water. Gotcha. I said he passed over snow and left no He's like snow Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, we got to be careful with Terry. Uh, you know, we we don't want to blow his ego up too much. Does he say ping me with drone and small camera questions? There you go. <laughs> oh, and everybody, apparently that picture is from the movie Haunt. So go there take a go. look at that. So Drone Cab for anybody uh, new here is an amazing amazing show that Terry. 
uh, Terry Jarrell runs, and he, he is, he's, he's a perfect example. He's forgotten more about drones than I ever care to learn. Uh, and he gives away everything he knows about drones small, and small camera systems uh, on the drone cap for absolutely free. So tune in, learn some shit, and take your filmmaking to the next level. Take your content creation to the next level uh, using drones. The Wagner Wiles, we love Lance and Samantha Wagner. Um, and well, everybody loves them except Clegg, uh, who I think I saw in here. Clegg, what's up? Um, so <laughs> there's a fun feud going on there. If you ever get a chance to go check that out, check it out. Lauren, what's up, brother? I uh, hope the Dark Military 2 is coming along. We're all waiting. So can you get on that? Thank you very much. And another thing about Lauren, he, he uh, actually premiered one of his short movies on our network, which we may start doing again pretty soon. So, Yeah, yeah. And Lauren and I have, have had coffee together, which was awesome. Great conversation. Great guy. Uh, very talented filmmaker and storyteller. So, and as you can see here, according to Lance, Clegg is his nemesis. Uh, what else? Uh, okay. Anything you want to learn about anything that's going on, you can find at RomeroPictures.com. Uh, very, very easy to remember, RomeroPictures.com. Uh, we've got links to just about everything that's going on with us, uh, with all things uh, Romero Pictures, uh, with all of the stuff I'm working on with Heavy Metal, uh, and Diga Studios, um, and we've got an awesome merch store. Uh, we keep threatening to add new merch, but um, that will eventually happen. But for now, you can go to RomeroPictures.com slash merch, get you some cool t-shirts, hats, coffee mugs, that type of stuff. And then we've got a line called Scare Tactical, and anything that you buy from the Scare Tactical line of Romero Pictures uh, Indie Brigade merch, uh, the profits go directly to uh, the Veterans Compound which is a nonprofit organization that uh, recently, uh, last season, um, finally got our 501c3 certification from the IRS. So we are a new 501c3 organization dedicated to uh, helping veterans process their experiences through the creation of uh, content. Um, Gunny John McLaren uh, is, is one of our resident uh, veterans. He is one of the best people I've ever known. I'm, I'm proud to call him brother and uh, happy that he's here. Uh, and so that's it. So uh, Scare Tactical, RomeroPictures.com forward slash merch. Go get you some Scare Tactical stuff and help us help veterans. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, what else? Let's see. We, uh, you'll see Joe and I are using these amazing Aston microphones right here. Um, I don't really, I can just kind of see a little piece of it, but I'm telling you these things are sweet. Uh, Aston Microphones is one of the best microphone companies. There you go. There's a better shot of it. Uh, one of the best microphone companies in the world, started by a gentleman uh, that I respect the hell out of because of his outlaw approach to starting his microphone company a handful of years ago um, and quickly rose to receiving awards like Best Microphone of 2019, I think. Um, so these are the Stealth Microphones. They are reasonably priced, and they are phenomenal phenomenal microphones uh, so check them out if you have voiceover needs check them out if you've got uh, ADR needs any any of that stuff uh, if you're doing a podcast if you're doing creating any sort of content in a controlled environment I haven't taken one out on set yet but uh, hopefully that will happen this year on one of the three to four films that I will be uh, directing this year so that's the other big announcement we dropped at the end of last season the very cool thing about that is that my intention is to uh, actually put as much of that process uh, out to the public via the Indie Brigade here. Um, I would like to make everything that I do and everything that I go through um, available to everybody in the Indie Brigade so you all can kind of see the process and, uh, and see how, how I get it done. Not that my way is right, but it's just how I do things. So uh, I'm very excited about that. That's going to be super fucking cool. Uh, our own Richard Grieco is actually going into production on a film called Night of the Tommyknockers on Monday, I think. And uh, he's going to be doing some appearances from set uh, over the next couple of weeks, so that's going to be super fun. And he's going to record some stuff for us, and he'll be here later to talk a little bit about that. Uh, also joining us later this evening is The Professor. Fuck yes. Uh, we love Grieco and The Professor, so we will talk about that, and I think it's going to be a good conversation because uh, our first guests tonight are Mr. Andre Gower and Mr. Ryan Lambert from the Musker Squad. 
And you probably have also heard of the documentary Wolfman's Got Nards. So um, I think that uh, it should be an interesting conversation tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, of course, we've got plenty of room and time for all of your questions for Andre and Brian. So, and, um, But wait, there's more. There is more. Coming up after Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade, we've got Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade, end of the night, with our very own... Mr. David Lee Madison. His guest tonight will be Marilyn Gigliotti, who we all know from Clerks, and I think that that's going to be a super fun fucking show tonight. So I'm glad y'all are here. I'm glad y'all stick with us. I'm glad y'all came back. And, uh, and I love every single one of you. <laughs> so thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for helping us make the brigade what it is. And thanks for being patient as we kind of figure it all out. So, you know, this is kind of something that's new to a lot of us, and, and we're working very hard to bring more shows and content. We've got some more shows that are still in the works, but they are coming. Um, and uh, it's, it's very cool. It's, it's been one of the, the best experiences of my, of my entire life doing the Indie Brigade so far, and I look forward to doing it as long as you guys will keep watching. So thank you for everything. Thank you, everybody. And uh, boom, there you go. Let's see. I think uh, a bunch of other people have tuned in. Yep, we got to do a little more housekeeping, tiny bit more. And since you have like the better voice, Clegg says that uh, my voice is like fine wine. Getting a couple of complaints that your volume is a little low. Well, do you want my volume low, or do you want other people to echo? Uh, survey says I, I'd that? rather have your volume low. Are you hearing sure echo? Are you getting echo at this point? Echo, 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 hello. Uh, a little, not enough to annoy me. All right. Anyway, Itai, hello, what's up, Itai. brother? <laughs> Itai from My Indie Productions. What is up, man? Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we, well, we can all see the StreamYard graphics, so let's go ahead and talk about that quickly. <laughs> and while you have that up there, I'm going to awkwardly readjust my microphone while nobody can see me because that could be part of what's going on. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I like that noise. Um. <laughs> wow. All right, so I I'll take over on Stream this for a second one. Uh, go. I got it right now. StreamYard. Okay. It is the platform that we use uh, to stream the Romero Pictures Heavy Metal Indie Brigade to you all live. Um, we actually have been using StreamYard since the beginning. A whole lot of people were asking us what platform we used and how it how we did it and how it was so cool. Uh, over the quarantine period, over COVID, over 2020, I guess those are all basically synonymous now. Um, we noticed a lot of people started using it, and you know we're very proud to be one of the sort of first loud partners that they had, especially in the fringe outlaw world. Um, you know, we, we get to test a lot of things out. We get to work closely with those guys to help make the platform as good and powerful and strong for all of you as we possibly can. So uh, StreamYard is a great platform. We love those guys, and that's what we're using. Sweet. And we're getting a lot of, that's better, I can hear them now. Yeah, it was probably a little bit of placement. Yeah, I know. That's why I feel like, you know, I have to have this, like, <laughs> anywho. <laughs> Unfortunately, you, you tell me if I'm too far away from it that. Yeah, now sound you as... sound real soft. Okay, well, that's why I'm like this. We're working it so. out, folks. We're working it out. You'd, you'd think after six seasons we'd have this shit down to a science, but, you know, we're figuring it the fuck out. Um, let's see. What else is the big news? Hey, guess what happened? We have two guests waiting in the green room? Yeah, but guess what else happened first? <laughs> I give up. I hear buzzing. Mm. Now I do not hear buzzing. Mm. Okay. That was what was going on with my AirPods, which is why I had to take them out. Um, the first issue of The Rise was published in uh, issue 302 of Heavy Metal Magazine. And guess what I happen to have right here? Bam! Um, Playboy? Look at that. Heavy oh, Metal. Heavy Metal. Number 302. And just so you all know, I'm super excited about this because there it is. Issue number one of The Rise is officially out in publication. 
Uh, I hope you go find it. I hope you pick it up. And I hope that you subscribe to Heavy, Heavy Metal so that you can catch all 13 issues of it. Um, and we've had some amazing conversations. There is some phenomenal, phenomenal stuff coming uh, with regard to Rise. Uh, and you can all look forward to some, uh, some pretty cool announcements over the next several months. So, so you are officially a writer for Heavy Metal Magazine now? Well... Yeah, I mean, I have been for a minute, but <laughs> but now it's a fit. You, you have it in your hands. Yeah, it's I'm everybody an, uh, else it's, can see it. I'm officially published now. Man, there you go. How, That's how what I was looking cool for. Is this, by the way, how fucking cool is this? Because Heavy Metal Magazine, like, how many of us had Heavy Metal when we were kids, right? Like, it was a fucking amazing. And and how amazing is this? I don't know if you all can can see that. Oh wait, no, you can't. Wait, I gotta figure this out. Hold on. I can't see in front of the fucking magazine. Damn it. <laughs> Look at that. I'm assuming it says Damn. Romero on there. There Damn. it is. There it is. Over here. Yeah, buddy. How and fucking Romero. amazing. That's like bucket list shit, man. That is like, uh, <laughs> that's amazing. That's one of those things that growing up, you just, you know, you're like, man, I'd love to write something for heavy metal. And then one day, you're writing something for heavy metal. It is fucking amazing, Libby. It's fucking wild is what it is. It's, it's just nuts. And, uh, it's, you know, and I gotta be honest with y'all, it probably would have never happened if Joe hadn't sent an email, um, back at the beginning of quarantine, um, to, to try to get uh, heavy metal, uh, to talk to us about, uh, DEF CON one, um, which was actually the very first online only fan convention, uh, ever done. And, uh, we did it actually about two months before anybody else. So um, that was when the fated uh, meeting of me and Matt Medney, this, the new CEO of Heavy Metal, happened. And, uh, and now here we are. Boom, boom, boom. Yes, so first two-day online convention. Yeah, it was insane. It was nuts. It was super fun. We had awesome people. We streamed for like 16 and a half hours. Yeah, that's a good hashtag, Blame Joe. <laughs> yeah. Buddy. All right. You ready? All right. Well, are you going to do some intros, or am I just popping people up and scaring the crap out of them? Or... Yeah, do that. All right. Andre and Ryan, I'm popping you guys up, man. You have been warned. There's Andre. What's up? And there's Ryan. Gentlemen, how are you? <laughs> Jesus. Ryan, are you all right? Are you... I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Andre, are you there? Or are you... Are you... Are you actually frozen? Uh -oh. or are you just are you just posing for dramatic entry? That's one hell of a pose. That's amazing. Uh -oh. That's fucking dramatic as hell. So anyway, when Andre and I were kids, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, how are you? I'll just say, <laughs> I got you, Andre. There he is. I'm a little. Uh, Ryan, how are you? I'm fine. How are you guys doing? I'm, I'm great. I'm, I'm glad great. someone fixed the sound thing because I'm like, I can't hear George oh, at all. Okay. And I'm uh, like, oh no, he's going to be asking questions. So I'm going to be like this, like listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was broken and that was Joe's fault, but it's fixed. So that was me. Sounds great so now. That, You're all good. That's how it works and around here. Congratulations on heavy metal because uh, I was, that was my jam when I was a kid. I loved getting the new issue of heavy metal, loved the film, loved all that artwork. So, uh, that's, uh, that's a thumbs up for me, dude. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. That means the world to me. Um, yeah. you know, obviously like pretty much everybody here, I'm a massive, massive fan of monster squad. So, uh, ah. having both of you guys here tonight is, uh, is just kind of a huge deal for me. So I'm very excited about it. I think Andre is still, um, still huh. for the dramatic effect. <laughs> He's really usually, I have to say, it's usually me that's going through this. <laughs> and Andre is going like, I don't know where he is. Maybe he went to the can or something. <laughs> he's he's really committed to that smoldering stoicism this evening. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, so, if you can hear me, it's just awesome to uh, have you here too, man. Um, obviously we're going to have a lot of people who are interested in talking to you about, uh, monster yeah. squad and asking you some questions. We've got a lot of people who are very excited. I think Tammy Coleman maybe um, found us tonight because of you guys. Uh, she is a first time. Viewer well, I heard tonight. that. Um, 
So I'm looking forward to a lot of those questions. Uh oh. Oh, I think we're connected. Uh oh. Is he here? I heard him. Is he live? <laughs> Well, for for the three people who haven't seen the movie, this is what we're referring to. If you haven't seen it, you you got issues. Go. If you haven't seen watch. it, you should probably. I don't know if you're welcome here. Right? No, of course you're welcome here. Just go watch it. <laughs> Whatever. I'm not that polite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Man. Anyway, you, do, was that Andre? For a oh. split second. Oh, well, All there right. he goes. Oh, well. Bye. <laughs> so, Ryan, Good. will there be... Now will we there be really a, talk. <laughs> sure. Will there be any singing or dancing tonight? I, if you want, I can... Uh, I don't know. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I might dance. I might dance. <laughs> there might be a slight singing version something we'll see what happens i don't know it, it'll be spontaneous and fun we'll see <laughs> well actually you know what and hopefully we get andre back up here too but in the meantime you know our very own david madison is a massive fan of the monster squad as well and i would love Hello, if we could bring him up to be part of tonight's show and part of tonight's chat with you guys andre are you there i'm gonna say no on dave so i just think don't so. worry about it <laughs> <laughs> well, andre, andre may be here now Nope. Yeah. Let's see, Dave. Let's see. I'm going to move Dave over here. And... If it makes you guys feel any better, there was one night um, in particular where this happened to me, and then my computer crashed, like literally <laughs> as we were starting the show. <laughs> Is it just me, or does Andre have a serious Chris Pine vibe going on tonight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope you heard that. Well, it's a compliment. I mean, he's. One of the sure is a good looking man. There you go. Dude. There you go. David, Looks how are great you? In the fanny pack. I'm very well. First off, I want to say hello to everybody. I hope everybody had a fantastic holiday season. Uh, I want to say happy birthday to Matt Staley, who's a part of the Romero Pictures Indie Brigade family. I want to say hello to Sean Smithson. I hope your surgery went well. And I also want to say I'm absolutely honored to be on the same screen with Mr. Ryan Lambert and Mr. Andre Gower. Uh, it was one of my favorite films of all time and i am honestly one of probably one of the very few people could honestly say they've seen it in a the theater so it was a long time ago it was a long time ago what year did it come out i, I think it came out in 89 80s, as i recall i think i probably saw it in the theater 1987 87 87 87 i, I probably saw it in the theater. i saw it in the angelica in new york city because i went to school at LaSalle academy on second avenue and second street and I cut my I last the, two classes. You're well. I know that oh. you're well. And uh, I, I, I cut my last two classes because I, I was a cheap bastard and I had to pay for the matinee. That's all I could afford back then. And uh, I went in not really knowing what to expect, but uh, it was just a fabulous movie. Ryan, can you tell me anything about what it was like to work with Duncan Regeer? Um, <clears throat> I didn't have many scenes with him. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact... I mean, the only thing maybe shot I'm in with him is that, you know, the final battle scene at the very end when he's being uh, sucked into the vortex and, you know, we're trying to hold on to Sean for dear life. Uh, he was there during that period. But he was, you know, he was around sometimes because uh, I would, you know, I would, I was like standing off to the side off camera when, uh, you know, he picks up uh, Ashley mm -hmm. and uh, I was kind of, laughing my ass off because she freaked out so hard <laughs> and uh uh but he he didn't uh i didn't work with duncan like i just saw dracula like mm -hmm. i didn't meet duncan until maybe 2016 or something like that so uh he really just focused he was dracula and that was it didn't come out until he was ready to uh, be on set. And other than that, uh, I never really, I never met the actual man. George, may I indulge in one other quick question? Yeah, of course, please. Oh. Uh, Fred Decker, the director who made the Monster Squad, 
Uh, his film previous, before The Monster Squad, was a, a, a fantastic horror movie, another fantastic movie called Night of the Creeps, I think, with, uh, as I, memory serves me, with Tom Atkins. And this yeah. is very, it's, a, it's not overwhelmingly known, but if you watch uh, uh, Night of the Creeps closely, in the high school bathroom on the wall, some it's it, in graffiti it says the monster squad rules or something to that effect way before he ever made the monster squad i think that's one of the coolest easter eggs in horror film history agreed i uh, yeah i didn't know that until after uh we had made the monster squad that that little thing existed uh you know shane and uh fred they they had been writing this thing for a long time so it, it was always like a, a story idea in their head and, um, you know, so that was sort of like their own little, like, you know, to themselves, really, not knowing what the Monster Squad was going to be uh, to the, you know, these days, not when it, you know, when it came out, obviously, it didn't do very well, but uh, it was just, it was just sort of a nod to themselves. And it's kind of cool now that people like, you know, you, Dave, like, you get to see that kind of stuff and point it out. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> and when you it's say, sh I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's like Scott Meany says the Monster Squad inspired his love of horror at an early age. Thank you for the amazing work. Um, Deirdre says she loved that movie. Uh, where can she get a copy? A new copy. Um, so uh, yeah, I think my question is, um, my my first question is, what was that like? Uh, and 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 how how did the filmmakers approach the fact that you guys were going to be dealing with a lot of these monsters that were uh, icons to the world, to horror fans and everything? Or, or, or was that something, did, did anybody kind of go over the importance, the potential importance of the, the, the material that you guys were going to be working with or the, or the creatures or the monsters? Or was it just everybody, they didn't want to put that kind of pressure on you? Or, or was it, you know, was it a big deal? Were you aware of like, you know, the history of these monsters. I was certainly aware, um, just by being like sort of a monster kid myself when I was little, I loved watching all the old classics, uh, late at night when you're not supposed to, just like we all did. <laughs> um, as far as them making sure we were aware, I believe Fred and Shane kind of went over it with us a little bit and it was more like their history with it you know you can see it you can see both their histories in the documentary wolfman's got nards uh directed by andre gower out now on blu-ray and <laughs> um but you can yeah there there it is uh he he did go over it a little bit but yeah it was more about their love for it and why this was a why this came into existence as far as like preparing us for actually being in their presence, zero. It was like, uh, today we're gonna do the scene where you meet uh, Frankenstein's monster. Great, you know, be on the set at 5.30 a.m., la da la da la da, be in makeup by 6.30, have your lunch, blah, 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 blah. We're, you know, standing on a set and there he is, what the? Like, we didn't see, I had never seen any, like, makeup tests or anything. I hadn't seen anything until Tom walked on the set as, uh, dressed as Frankenstein's monster. And it was, it was a little overwhelming at first. It was a little hard. But the, the other thing a lot of people got, you got to remember, there's hundreds of people around us. <laughs> you know, and oh, they're yeah. all doing, they're all doing things and pulling fucking cables and like, you know. And there's lighting and everyone's yelling at each other and Fred's trying to command the whole thing. And then I'm just kind of standing there like, just tell, you know, I always say like, just tell me where to stand here. And then I say the thing right there. Okay. That's what I do. <laughs> that's my job. And then, uh, yeah. And then this looming figure comes and just like, Oh my God. I think, I, well, I was a little, I'm, you know, I'm older than the other kids, uh, by a couple of years. So I think I was already like, and I'm also playing the toughie. So it's like, if I'm on set going, <gasps> <laughs> that's not going to play. So uh, I had to, like, you know, put on airs and be like, you know, like, whatever, whatever with all this. Who cares? I'll kill all these things. You but know, as, a, but as a monster kid, you just you just said you were a monster kid growing up. What must that have been like, I mean, to see Frankenstein's monster? 
what was, was that the first one that you saw? Uh, besides maybe like when I went to Universal Studios when I was a kid and like, you know, they're all walking around. No, no, no. Just... I mean, like during filming, was that the first one that they brought out to you? Was Frankenstein's Monster? Oh, uh, let's see. Like in your schedule, uh, in your yeah, production I think schedule. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Did I you think have like a moment where you, was that like a big deal for it? Like, was, was it just a massive deal? being a monster kid. I think it was the first time we sort of read because like I think the first thing I shot was the the schoolyard scene with the bullies. So you know I'm like okay we're making like a you know Disney movie of the week you know it didn't it didn't the monster part hadn't come in yet. Yeah. And, uh, yeah so by the time we got to that it's like oh right <laughs> that's what we're doing. <laughs> got it. And then you you did I, I remember having to adjust a little bit you know. It was a little weird. All right. Hey, so I buddy. think we actually have Ryan here. But I just want to play on what George was saying, though. So from what I read, uh, Universal really got on this movie and Stan Winston, and the monsters couldn't look like Universal monsters. They had to adjust yeah. them. and Because they were still using them in the parks. They were still using the likeness in the, in the theme park. So... They couldn't, uh, they didn't want them to look exact. They said, you know, just don't, we had to make them look, you know, completely different than they did in the original productions, you know, yeah. of those, of those classic films. So, um, you know, drag, you can, but you can tell it's them. It's, the, it's right. the, you know, there's no mistaking that that's the creature from the Black Lagoon. It's just like, right. ours is called the Gill Man. You know, <laughs> you know, but, and that design is incredible. I mean, it's, I mean, they almost, it, it almost was a blessing, I guess. Like, because it wasn't like, oh, we're just going to imitate and recreate. Like, we're going to actually, you know, think of a whole new concept of, of these creatures and these monsters, but with, with keeping the, 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 you know, sort of the original feelings uh, of each character. Uh, and Daniela says, one of the things that stuck with me about the movie was the camaraderie of the kids in the movie. They were realistic friends, not perfect heroes. Excellent, excellent. Cool. <laughs> Andre, happy you've made it back. Yeah, sorry, guys. And apparently, uh, I very rarely have tech issues. And my, apparently, my computer decided to take a dump. And, uh, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so, uh, I think I'm back, though. Um, until I'm not, but, uh, hopefully I sound good, so it's, it's fine. Uh, I have more more than enough confidence in Ryan to hold the fort now. For <laughs> now that now that you're here, I'm out of here. <laughs> <I knew that. laughs> David uh, had a very a very uh, David had a, co a compliment for you when you were freezing. So I think you met David before the show. Um, Brief, yeah. David Madison yeah. has joined us. David is a huge fan of Monster Squad, just like I am, just like Joe is, and just like everybody watching tonight is. Um, so uh, we've been just kind of we've been beating up Ryan with questions. Uh, oh, well, he deserves so. it. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you didn't hear it, Andre, I said you have a Chris Pine thing going on tonight. You look very, very. You got a Chris Pine thing. Serious, uh, yeah. reflective. Yeah, he's Captain Kirk. I'll take it. There you uh, go. There you go. <laughs> I usually have some scruff, and then it's been trimmed. It's sort of, it's sort I just of let it ties go. in, though, right? It sort of ties in, if you know, you know what I mean. Kirk? It does yeah, sort of tie I mean, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> what Ryan's alluding to is that I was T.J. Hooker's son. I'm T.J. Hooker. Um, so, which is kind of a weird twist. So, I think I should have been. So, you <laughs> actually, so you actually worked with William Shatner. I did, yeah. For you have my serious, sincerest condolences. I just got done working with him. <laughs> oh, and, uh, well, you got done with current Shatner, <laughs> apparently. Oh, I don't know if that is there a difference. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, he was. Um, it was. I, I. It was very memorable. I remember. You know, it was just a TV show. You you come on. You you know. You play a son, and you know, there's a sister, and um, I think we did three or four episodes, maybe five. I don't think it was that many, and then. Um, the show got canceled that season and then it oh. got picked up again i think by another i think it got picked up for another season or two by a different network but they went away from 
the kids living with them storyline. So we were out. <laughs> hey, one question for you guys about the Monster Squad. Uh, Shane Black was, of course, one of the co-writers. Uh, did you guys get to like work with him or meet him while you guys were filming the film? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, he was there from day one. Now, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, Shane is also the gentleman who was uh, one of the guys in the original Predator mm -hmm. and uh, has went on to be a major player in the MCU directing uh, Iron Man 3, as I recall. Uh, you you are correct. It, uh, yeah, Shane and Fred were friends in college, mm -hmm. and Fred had kind of had the idea for a story about the little rascals fighting the Universal Monsters, and Shane was like, oh, that's cool, and they started writing it. And that was the first thing that Shane had written that I believe actually got made. Fred had just done Night of the Creeps, um, you know, during that time they were you know, writing the script for Monster Squad, I believe, and, or even after. And, but what's cool about Shane is while we were making Monster Squad, he had sold his, like, first spec script for a little thing called Lethal Weapon. And so that was, uh, <laughs> that sort of took Shane on a, on a nice trajectory, like a fucking uh, Tesla rocket. <laughs> Um, it's amazing how no, these things happen. No, wait a yeah. minute. He he just told you who that guy's roommate was, David. You got to tell him who your roommate was now. Oh, in college? It's yes. funny because it's how how funny how close the the world is connected. You guys, of course, are connected to Shane Black. Uh, I went to Queens College and was roommates for three years with John Favreau, who started the MCU and who hired Shane Black. So it's funny. Yeah, and and I and I think what's what's so neat not only the trajectory of Shane through his spec scripts of the '90s, like after Lethal mm -hmm. Weapon and uh, Last Boy Scout and Long Kiss Goodnight, and then there was like a ten-year break, uh, and then he comes out with what I think is my my favorite Shane Black movie, which is Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and it's a great film. Ryan, Ryan and I talk about you know how simple but so good that movie is. Which also resurrected, in my opinion, uh, resurrected two actors from literally the dead, and that was Val Kilmer and Robert Downey Jr. And then a few years later, Robert Downey Jr. is fucking Iron Man. So it's uh, that's, uh, and I think that's kind of where that loops back around, where Shane directs and comes in and writes Iron Man three and and works in that world. So I think that was uh, a pr a pretty cool kind of circle coming around. And actually, right now he's prepping to start. Filming, I don't know if this is commonly known, but he's prepping to start filming the new Doc Savage movie, so that should be pretty epic. Uh, he, he, I think Shane and Doc Savage go back longer than Shane and the Monster Squad. Oh, really? Uh, I think I know it's something that he's always wanted to do, so I mean, we can't wait. It's you know, as, as long as they let him make a Shane Black movie, it's gonna be great. That's you know, it's funny. I mean, The Predator, which was the last Shane Black directed movie. And George, I'll shut the hell up. You could just zap me when I'm done babbling. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just drinking my coffee. And this is oh, awesome. I've got a mute button. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the last Predator movie that Shane directed, and you think that, you know, with his foundation in that, in that, uh, in that uh, series, uh, it would have been like one of the greatest Predator movies. But for some reason, it was like very, it was probably the first time that he's ever dropped the ball. And it was just, a, it, it's strange that that it came out that way. I don't know if it was too many, too many chefs with their hands in the, uh, in the, was what I suspect. But it's just, it's just weird watching that movie, knowing that that was Shane's baby. I, well, think, I think Andre's um, comment of uh, if they let him make a Shane Black movie. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, that's probably. Yeah, that's probably. Your questions there. George is adept at reading between the lines. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Ryan and I, you know, we, we've sat and talked about that. And I kind of, what was interesting is, you know, I kind of knew a little bit of what they were trying to work on when they were breaking the story. And some of that stuff was really cool. And I mean, that's a giant studio movie. And I, I think it went long and then they had to do some reshoots. And I don't know if it was too many chefs in the kitchen. It might've been too many suits in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then at the end with, you know, kind of final, you know, helicoptering of what this is or what that is. Um, I don't know. I mean, I had my personal opinions on it, which I thought could have been rad. Uh, I think what happened, purely personal opinion, you know, 
not not uh, the thoughts or or beliefs of anything official. Just just my dumbass is. Um, I, I think they ended up at the end uh, being the studio getting spooked on having those characters be those characters and allowing them to be what they were and. Uh, it, it seemed to not make sense, but if you would let it be, I think the whole thing would have been a tight ball with all those characters and what they were. Um, I know it got a little choppy at the end. They had to do a lot of, they had to go back and do a lot of reshoots and, and, and re-edits. And I, I think, I don't know. I don't, because we didn't get too de in depth in it with, with Fred or Shane at one point, but um, it, uh, it, that's my personal opinion is I think they should have just let that cast go and keep them in the movie. And um, it would have been pretty rad because that's really the whole thing, even in the original Predator. It's about that cast for that first two acts of that movie. And then it becomes just the Predator and Schwarzenegger because everybody's dead. But, um, you know, that camaraderie and that witty banter back and forth and the, and the craziness that was going on uh, with the seven, it's, you know, that, that story, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Yep. And, and Thomas Jane, anytime you have Thomas Jane in a movie, you can't fail. So, I mean, it's not a and, bad and, film, it's definitely a great popcorn movie. But it's just like I was expecting a lot more. I, I think that's a fair assessment. Well, I think you you named again personal opinion. You named the one guy of that crew of the of the of the crazies. You know, they're called the crazies or you know the misfits. Um, and he's the one with Tourette's because everybody in the movie has has some sort of on the spectrum of some of some level. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Thomas Jane being a you know an operator with Tourette's is. That's a funny combination, uh, and I think they got. I think somebody got scared of 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 allowing that to be out there as much as it was, thinking we can't make fun of people with Tourette's. And I was like, in my mind, you're not. You're celebrating people that can still do something that may have Tourette's, well, and absolutely. you're 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 clinching up in the wrong direction. Yeah. And uh, they should have just let all of those guys go. As funny as the words I'm sure were on the page, and the you know all those you know great faces and, and, and brains in that in that crew. They should just let them go and let them be the movie. Yeah, I promise to shut the days, hell up now, George. Uh, I'll shut the hell up now, too. As well. A lot of times these days, the, the I lawyers talk have about uh, it too, a nice but, table full uh, of lawyers right next see. to them. You can see it. All right. So w when I first contacted <laughs> Andre and Ryan, <laughs> uh, I, I explained to them I, what the Indie Brigade was about. And it, it was about up and coming filmmakers trying to get a foot in. And so what I would like to talk about a little more is Wolfman's Got Narts. Uh -oh. uh, if you guys have seen this documentary, seek it out. But how did that come about? Was it crowdfunded? Um, how did it all start? Well, it- um, It's at the 101 Cafe. <laughs> which, which is, is now, now closed. Which is now which closed. Is I know. You know, it, it was one of those. It was one of those things that uh, it ended up once it once it sort of happened. It happened very quickly, but the lead up to it was the experiences that myself and Ryan and, and Ashley Bank and, and and the rest of the the crew interacting with these fans over the last you know ever since two thousand six two thousand seven. That over time we we really understood that this was something different. It wasn't just something that was a, a kind of a flash in the pan kind of resurgence, and it was going to die away. That everybody said, "Oh, I'm fun. I got to see that again." This thing really took off, being the Monster Squad fandom. And the long story short is, is over time, I really saw that there were people that were very, very connected to this movie on different levels than I'd seen with other fandom. And I thought that was interesting to investigate a little bit or find out what that is and why did this movie die 30 years ago? And then now it's bigger than it even what, you know, ever could be. Uh, and why are people still talking about it? And it was about that connection and how movies, not just Monster Squad, but movies or, or books or songs uh, can actually impact and change people's lives or their worlds and, and affect who they are later on. And over time, I, you know, just was enthralled by that dynamic that we kept seeing out there on the road and online and on social media. And, you know, Ryan and I were on the road a lot, you know, even leading up to the 30th anniversary year. And, you know, I kind of batted around the idea that, hey, you know, we have our podcast at the time and let's, you know, find a crappy used camera and go on the road and, you know, kind of docu follow some of these, you know, crazy appearances we're going to do and then sit three or four people down in a chair in LA and talk about it and, you know, have one of our, you know, editor friends cut it together, you know, for pizza 
And uh, then, you know, we'll put it on the website or something. And I thought it was just going to be sort of something that was kind of, you know, low and, 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 and gritty and grindy. And I experimented with that one time and we went to a big event and got this and it just didn't, it wasn't, it, it didn't really work. And the timing right then was interesting because I was doing another project that sort of actually two things that were taking off. Uh, one of them became Short Ends, which is the show that Ryan and I co-hosted together on uh, Nerdist, Nerdist Digital Channel. And where we did sort of, you know, what you guys celebrate, you know, we, we looked at short films and celebrated making of short films and short filmmakers and, you know, how they can start out in their career. And so the, the documentary idea kind of went on a side burner for a couple months. And I had this very kind of sliding doors, serendipity afternoon uh, with an old friend of mine going to lunch and in front of her office building, uh, these three guys walked out of it and they ended up being the three guys that ended up being my production team for Wolfman's Got Nards at Pilgrim Studios. And once that kind of serendipitous meeting took place, we started talking about this project and that was something they were interested in. And we put it together and brought it to the executives at Pilgrim, um, pitched it to them and we were off and running in, in literally like a week. And it was great timing because we were going right into the 30th anniversary year. And over the next 10 months, which is what we actually shot footage on, um, we crammed a lot of a lot of stuff in there. We got to go to a lot of places. And you know, poor Ryan didn't know what he was in for when I said, I'm going to work on this project and you're going to be a big part of it because uh, we're going to the stuff. But it's not just these appearances. We we be making a movie. You know, you're gonna have a camera in your face a lot of the time too, and uh, you're gonna. But even at the the time of where it got uh, kind of greenlit, we didn't know about half of what we had were gonna fall into place in that ten month time span. So uh, Henry McComas and I and 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 the team at Pilgrim and then myself and Ryan and Ashley for all these events and appearances, everything just kind of fell in line for the best possible ten months of grabbing experiences that we could possibly hope for um you know I, the synopsis talks about looking at cult film through the lens of the monster squad and and uh you know i i think what's interesting to me is that uh like you both have said actually tonight that neither of you realized um what was going to happen with monster squad 30 years later and you know, I mean, what are what? I guess, in my opinion, you know, and a lot of our a lot of our viewership, a lot of the members members of the Indie Brigade, um, are just massive fans of the Monster Squad, massive fans of you guys, uh, massive fans of Shane, massive fans of the whole thing. And you know, I think, wh what did you? What was your perception of sort of the cult film world going into making Wolfman's Got Nards, uh, and and how did that change by the time you finished? And what is your perception of that cult film world now? I found it interesting <clears throat> seeing the final product actually uh, with uh, with you know Andre and I discussing it a little bit before we uh, you know before Andre embarked on the whole entire process. So, but uh, beforehand, we we would always ask ourselves like, why? Why is this? What is? How do we get to the to the bottom of this? How do we get to the heart of it? How do we find out what that word actually means in terms of film? And, you know, everyone's got their like little cult things. And, and obviously there's like the umbrellas of Rocky Horror and stuff like that, that are actually where maybe that came from and Night of the Living Dead and all these other like, you know, amazing old films that like, where, did, you know, where did this like phenomenon come from? And, 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 and what are people's opinions on this? And the best, I think my, my favorite part about the whole thing and that question particularly is that we got like a hundred different answers, which I love, you know, what is a cult <laughs> film? I don't know. <laughs> I guess it's something that, uh, you know, maybe didn't do so well at the box office, but then found an audience later. And then it has like this kind of underground uh sort of like you know secret password kind of thing you're wearing a shirt that says stephen king rules in at a convention and someone comes up to you and says you know what stephen king does rule <laughs> george a. romero does rule um and then someone goes yeah, yeah yeah but i know stephen king rules but you don't know what this is from you don't know what, what this shirt represents exactly <clears throat> and uh but if you do if someone comes up to you and goes the monster squad 
then yep. you're in the goddamn club. You know, it's it's, it's, a, like it's a very right. tight. Yes, exactly. It, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it puts it out it's... there that you understand what something is and it's ours. And like, you know, people walk around with Freddy, Jason, whatever, we all know we got it, you know. Uh, Frozen, we know, we, we can see it, we've all seen it. Uh, but, you know, you got the Monster Squad shirt on and someone knows it, it's very special. And I think that's what makes a cult film. And so I think what what Ryan just... I think Ryan just touched on the interesting thing that kind of ties in with the other half of the experience that we, you know, kind of found out. Um, there's a funny dynamic where a lot of kids that saw Monster Squad, whether they saw it in the theater, you know, you know, David said he saw it in the theater. Uh, he was either the only one or there's maybe three in that theater that night. And um, or they found it on VHS or HBO. And, you know, they passed it around the schoolyard or they, you know, put the VHS tape and, and gave it to their friends uh, in the cul-de-sac. But a lot of kids that saw in the theater, running, they didn't know it wasn't a huge box office thing. They just thought it was this awesome movie that they loved and didn't know about numbers and, and, and the industry and, and, and longevity. Uh, and so they didn't realize why it would be a cult. And like, this isn't a cult film. This is just a classic film that's one of the best of all time. And so that's another element that, like Ryan says, is like everybody has their own answer. And, you know, it's very interesting to be, you know, mentioned, you know, as, as, as two kids that are part of a movie that's in this kind of category that has transcended not only the year that it, you know, came out, but three decades after that will probably, because of archetypes and themes and characters and situations uh, and effects paradigms that right when I jumped in with tech issues, you were talking about creatures, um, I, I think will hold a place very interesting in cinema, monster, cult, horror movies for a long time. And I don't think you can plan for that in 1986, 1987. Uh, but it's sort of something that that ended up happening with this movie. And I think that's also makes it more special for the people that what I really take away out of why these people connected with it, like Ryan was asking the question, is everybody feels either they're loners or weirdos or a misfit and they only, you know, they, they, they like this cool stuff that they think is cool, but nobody else understands or doesn't like. But when you walk into a room and you see someone with a Stephen King rule shirt, you know that person gets you and understands and back in 87 89 91 when you're on vhs and hbo you're only dealing with those kids maybe your outreach is maybe the next town over or a summer camp and you can trade it and these little pockets of 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 squad army was was building over time and then the internet came out and we had that original screening and it just blew up and i think they all got to come together and they all felt that they're the only ones that knew this movie and it was their duty to show it to their friends and they bought more into the fold and made their own club. And then they realized there was a lot more like that. So they all didn't feel like misfits as, as individuals anymore. They were all part of this larger group that celebrated around this title. And that's a pretty cool thing to be involved in. It's an amazingly cool thing to be involved with. Um, do you guys think that it's possible to for any film to ever have that kind of personal connection cult type thing ever again these days now that we've got the internet now that everything is so connected now that the you you know i mean like you said hbo and and it was it was not easily accessible once it was no longer in theaters um do you think that can ever ever happen again i mean Sorry, obviously Robert. time will tell Start with time will tell i guess um but Honestly, I don't think so. I'm not saying Monster Squad was, that was it. That was the last one. <laughs> like, we did it. No, no, cool. I don't mean it like yeah. that. I just mean, but do you I, think it's possible no, for that know, to happen? Everything's again. so readily available now. It's just so out there. You can't have something that is so, I mean, you might have something that might seem cultish because like not a lot of people saw it and like maybe like a TV show that didn't, people didn't really watch that it was only out for two seasons. And like, oh, I love that show. Oh, you, oh, you didn't see that? Oh, you got to see this. Like, but it was only on for two seasons. Yeah, but they're amazing. You've got to see mm -hmm. it. Uh, I think it would be more on that level. Um, I think maybe more like indie films might do that, like really super independent films that only got like a limited, you know, run. But then, boom, it's on, they're on, you know, Amazon Prime right away, and so they're they're available. There's still a lot of word of mouth with a lot of things, but. 
uh, yeah, it's just hard to to imagine something being being that much of a failure at one point, and then th this many years later becoming some sort of weird phenomenon. I don't know mm -hmm. if that'll ever happen. Yeah, and I, 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 I think all of the things I, I agree. I think I would certainly never say absolutely never again. Nothing's ever going to change someone's lives that they watch on a screen or, or on a tape, um, because I think music does that all the time. And but I, I honestly think it was a combination of multiple things at the right time when it was made and when it came out and then shortly after and then just sort of that kind of afternoon period after that until it kind of you know the sun rose on it again i i don't know if we're going to have that epic in time of technology and movies you know stories that we were having you know kids adventure films that you know started to get a little more dangerous now we're used to it you know there, there wasn't very many kids adventure films that were actually dangerous there's a handful but most of them were were fun and campy and cartoonish uh, the kids were talked down to. They weren't sort of the main voice. Um, and I think it just was the, the it was interesting is everything was right timing for the Monster Squad for it to be what it became, but not for what to be a hit in 87, which is a, which is a, which is a weird uh, recipe. But I also think in defense of the Monster Squad is that the studio had no idea how to market that film. I only knew about the film because I saw the poster in the lobby. And uh, as I recall, I might be I might be wrong, but as I recall, they released it like at the they released it like in February, like the worst time of year for that type of film. It, it was even worse. It was the middle of August for a kids movie that should have been was it, somewhere was near. It yeah, August? It was, yeah, the middle of August, two weeks after the Lost Boys came out. Mm -hmm. so, so it was that, a, that didn't help, mm -hmm. right? And like you said, you only saw a poster in the lobby. There wasn't a lot of marketing push out there because I don't think they knew how to market it at the time uh as is evidenced in wolfman's got nards we look at some of the marketing campaigns that they used um which are fascinating and mind-blowing but they sort of had kind of parallel and almost contradictory marketing campaigns that were very confusing and like i said the recipe of multiple things at that time happening and one of them was one of them was the marketing campaign two was the rating we got a pg-13 rating which might have been a little unfair um, especially nowadays, there's no way it's, you know, it's, a, it's almost a G movie compared to, you know, what you find on, you know, primetime now. But um, you had these kind of, some of the trailers were dark and vicious and scary, but at a PG-13 rating. So parents were not going to let their 9, 10, 11 year olds see this movie. And they, they weren't going to go to the movie with them because they weren't interested in it. And then the cool kids that were, you know, 14, 15, 16, it was too kid oriented because what they saw was more some of the marketing that was campy and kid like, mm -hmm. which contradicted the other dark, dangerous stuff. And so the the older cool kids were not going to go see it because they were going to go see the Lost Boys and not follow it up with this kids movie. And then the younger kids weren't. So you had a very small window of maybe eligible ticket buyers, but then their parents still had to go, and that's why it didn't last in the theaters that long. Mm -hmm. And we've been you know talking about it for the last couple months you know, since the release of the doc uh, about how unfair your 48 hour window of success or failure back in those days, that's your only barometer of success. Yeah. And if you're, if you don't hit a certain number that they set before anybody has eyes on your movie, if you don't hit that, then you're gone. And I think that's unfair for mostly for people like Fred Decker, but also fair, unfair for moviegoers that don't get to maybe see something that could have been cool for them. Um, and I think that's in general for, you know, there's a lot of movies that didn't do well that just suffered and had to find them, find, find themselves later. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, the, the rating, the marketing campaign, all those things are part of the recipe that made it exactly what it was for the time, but created the situation that it wasn't going to work then, but created that situation that made it what it is now. So it's a very interesting, I don't know of any other, com you know, combinations like, I can't, I can't think of many that have all of those facets. Yeah, there was all, it, that time was that time in the eighties was ripe for that recipe because you had films like Near Dark, which had no theatrical presence but is a beloved cult film. Uh, you had Waxwork, which is uh, another beloved cult film. Uh, 
but uh, the Monster Squad clearly stands uh, heads above uh, uh, those films in far as far as uh, being Waxworks loved today. Waxworks 2 is way better, by the way. Waxworks 2. <laughs> Why? Because it got better. built with Bruce Campbell? Better. It's the better film. It's the better film. I, I, don't worry about me. No, no. I mean, I I, I actually, I'm one of those weird people who love both Waxworks movies. I have no idea why. I love them both, but I'm telling yeah. you, Waxworks yeah. 2 is better. To this day, I think Wax, Waxworks 1 has the best werewolf transformation scene in film history. But oh, John, really? John okay. Reese Dave. Well, John Reese Dave. Now we're dueling. Now we're dueling. Uh oh. Here we go. <laughs> no, Here well, we go. <laughs> yes, I remember that. I remember that. Yes. Amazing. Well, Not plus David had Zach on his show, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but no, I think you're right. There's a lot of other examples, but I did enough. Yeah, I don't want to sound biased because you know we're in the movie, but I, you can make other examples that are are perfect, perfect examples of cult movies that that found their audience. Um, I, but there were so many things, and I only know these things because we investigated them for a year, you know, and, or, or discovered them of, you know, maybe this was a thing. Oh, boy, someone mentioned this that we never thought of before. And it's just this amazing kind of combination of, of kind of bullet points that go down that only work when they're all together to create the situation we're in. And that was really the dis one of the major discoveries that I found personally as, as you know, uh, uh, this doc documentary is being made. Um, it, it, but it's just fascinating how these fans are part of, even if they've never met each other, that, you know, can connect over something that uh, means so much to them. And I, I'll circle back as like Ryan was talking about, you know, you're talking about the monsters and, and the likenesses. Uh, you have to give credit to the Stan Winston crew for, I, I think the best thing that ever happened to Monster Squad uh, was that they couldn't copy the universal Jack Pierce looks because it made these guys reimagine, like Ryan said, you know who they are, they're them. You just can't have the, you gotta change creature and you gotta change Frankenstein a little bit. And then the reimagining of a mummy as a, as a smaller person. And then, you know, doing a wolfman, but taking facets from all the, the good wolfmans and the, uh, you know, wolfmen in the past, um, you know, created this thing. But it was about the skill and the artistry of how they built these practical suits and these, and these makeup effects right at that time of the late 80s going into the you know early pre-dawn of digital age where it replaced everything i think it was right at that right time because those suits changed the game for all of uh, practical creature making going forward i don't think monster squad itself was the only movie that did that i'm saying at that time you know that era of, the, of when people were doing and most of them were these stan winston guys and uh, they worked on some pretty badass movies that that literally flipped the paradigm on, on creature making because they did aliens they did predator they did monster squad and you know all these other things at that time and his masterpiece Pumpkinhead. some of the, <laughs> some, of the, some of the comments that people are making are, i mean they're these I'm, I'm listening to you guys talk, and I'm looking at these comments. Joe's putting some of them up, but they're coming down the side of the screen, too. And some of these memories, they're so specific. Like, people remember how old they were, where they went to see it, uh, who took them. Um, you know, Sean Smithson, uh, his, his mom took him out of school to go see it. You know, Daniela <laughs> says she was nine, uh, and uh, her parents thought it was going to be a lot darker than it was. Uh, and then they got it on VHS. You know, I mean, I remember when I, whenever there was stuff that was in that kind of gray area, I would, you know, I was that kid who would hop on a city bus and go downtown Pittsburgh to see movies. Or, you know, when I was far too young to hop on a city bus unattended. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I was that guy. And, and you know, and I was the kid who, who, who would go to places to find comic stores and all that stuff. And there was a group of us that all had that same street cred that we were talking about earlier that came from your ability to not only find, but devour all of this sort of fringe content that may or may not have been successful at the time. And, you know, you'd get copies of Fangoria magazine or copies of Heavy Metal magazine, or, you know, um, you'd see movies that other people didn't see. And, you know, if you were in that gray area of the age gap that you were talking about earlier, Andre, you know, you were like the badass kid in the right age group for Monster Squad <laughs> because you saw it, um, you know, <laughs> and there was there was this whole there was this camaraderie that went around, um, you know, among all of us who who had the balls to go seek this stuff out, I think. And I think that that was a huge part for me of what defined cult films 
was that it took balls for us to go find it. Um, you know, it wasn't something that we could go look up, download, or get our parents to get for us. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about this. Um, I think Ryan and I have actually been on a podcast talking about the same thing, where back in that day, you actually had to go on an adventure almost to go watch adventures on the screen. Like there was a, the movie theater was not in your house or it wasn't in your pocket. That's right. It was, you had to go. So it was either a group trip or you got on your bike or you got on the bus or you had your, your parents drop you off or your cool uncle or your grandma would take you to the mall and go see a movie. Uh, and those are all part of the overall experience. And I love what George said, you know, where people are mentioning and we saw some of them, like they know exactly where they saw a certain movie. This just happens to be Monster Squad. I know exactly when and where I saw, you know, other very impactful seminal movies like Megaforce. Um, but the... Uh, Love Megaforce, by the way. The, um, I know. We, uh, that's terrible. Um, uh, it was only because I was watching The Thing and when the dog turned inside out, my sister made me go next door. So I had to see Megaforce. Um, but it, I think that's part of that experience that burns into your in, into your experience and uh, as as part of that thing. Now we can we can literally flip on and go through an interface of a thousand movies and go, eh, oh, I just pick one. Mm -hmm. But you, and you know, the you adventure remember. element, the adventure comment that you made, and we've got a couple of guys in the lobby that I'd like to bring up uh, into this chat as well. But just before we do that, the adventure thing you were talking about, you're right. It was an adventure to go see it. And then after you saw an adventure film like that, on your trip home as a kid, that all of that was the subtext of your adventure getting home and you know and it was like uh it really was it was amazing it was just a phenomenal experience to go and and find that stuff and then get home safe and then figure out what the hell you were going to tell your parents so it, right because <laughs> <laughs> you probably weren't where you were supposed to be or where you said you were going to be exactly it, it, i mean it, i don't know i never did that ryan did that all the time i know because yeah. <laughs> he, he was much <laughs> There Ryan was in the George cool, cool group. You know, I was never cool enough to really do bold shit. There was nothing but, cool uh, about it. It was just, George, uh, a, a 20 second story that's going to really uh, touch on what you guys are talking about. I went to go see American Werewolf in London with my brother when I was, uh, I don't know, I was nine or 10 when that flick came out. And when uh, Griffin Dunn comes back half eaten for the first time, I was like, I'm checking out. I'm out of here. I literally ran out of the theater and ran in and watched Arthur because I was too scared shitless to finish American Whale from London. <laughs> and now that will always be with me is the way I saw Arthur was running away from American Whale from London. But so many people having so many wonderful uh, memories of seeing uh, Monster Squad is uh, uh, only shows of what a tentpole movie it was and how, uh, how deeply it affected them. So that's just a really cool thing when people say stuff like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, George hit on it. Ryan set it up and George hit on it was it's it's about the overall experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really does make a difference. And I, I think that was probably one of those times of, um, I don't think it would, if it came out in 77, I don't think we would have had the same dynamic. If it came out in 97, you know, it would have been, you know, Rudy would have been Freddie Prince Jr. or somebody, you know, and it would have not been the same movie. <laughs> <laughs> well guys we've got um we've got a couple of our uh regular indie brigade um awesome people in the lobby i guess we've got uh two we'll brothers say. of mine we'll richard grico and mr michael mandeville uh, f uh very affectionately known around here as the professor um they've been patiently listening to us in the lobby and i have a feeling i'd love to get them in this conversation so if they're down there can we bring them up joe we can. Grico. <laughs> professor, Creative Explorer, Professor Michael Mandeville. How are you doing there, Andre, Ryan, David, Joe? Good, Michael. How are you? Richard, how are Grico. you, brother? Good to see you guys. Good. How was hey, your holiday, Mr. Mandeville? It was good overall, you know, a lot of family and stuff like that. So um, uh, just local everybody local everybody in the circle i'll say so we're good there but uh i had uh i had some little operation on my nose on the 23rd uh, squeezing it in at the end of the year and uh it was one of those things where i was awake like four hours a day for about a week 
It was funny because when you first popped on the screen, I was like, I didn't know Tom Selleck was coming on the show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, gratuitous uh, flattery will get you everywhere in this industry. So thank you for that, David. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Ryan, Ryan, was it something David said? It usually is. <laughs> no, I think he, I saw him. He froze up for a second there. He might he have something against Tom Selleck? <laughs> <laughs> Greco, we have to take a minute and talk about the hat you're wearing because I'm just insanely, insanely jealous of this hat that you're wearing. That is a pretty cool hat. That's that. Can I can I tell people? Or yeah, you, you should tell yeah. people. It's it's a it's from Barons, um, made by the same company, um, and using the same process that made the the uh, the hats for all the no name films with Mr. Clint Eastwood, um, and uh, that hat was just custom made for Mr. Greco. And uh, I'm so just ridiculously jealous and so happy for you that you have it. It is just fucking, it's the coolest hat ever. So if maybe you're tell everybody, uh, well, first of all, hello, happy new year. Well, welcome back. Happy new year. Michael, happy new year. Welcome back. Happy new year. Why, why do you have such a fabulous fucking amazing hat? Well... When you do it, when, you, when you're going to do a Western, you never leave it up to the wardrobe to get a fucking cowboy hat. <laughs> so when I talk to, I'm not going to say names, but wardrobe, they go, oh, we'll just get you on what's your size. And I went, you know, I'll handle it. So I had a couple people that were, and I kind of looked at the, uh, because no one's worn that style hat from, and it's, like I did it, um, I wore the James Dean type of coat in, in, uh, in Rebel Run, you know what I mean? And everyone's like, you can't do that. And uh, and I did, and uh, um, it's kind of an homage to, to Dean and, and uh, the cars and stuff. And this one was taking a big kind of thing, and it's because of Outlaw Josie Wales, one of my favorite films. And uh, this is exact, uh, uh, same style and everything of, of, of the hat that he wore in that movie. So, um, well, I and, and, him, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you the 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 news that you dropped in that is that you were about to do a fucking western. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somewhere in there. And I think yeah, that we're all pretty. I know personally, I'm pretty jealous of that too. Because oh, absolutely. I want to do a western. I want to do a western. So uh, I'm super. I, I met a, a a couple people that would uh, do those fast draws, and one of the guys, I mean, could shoot two or three targets in a few seconds. I mean, these guys do thousands and thousands of draws, and so he was training people how to do it for westerns, and you know. Um, he had a hat kind of like that, but not quite as cool. So I want you to know that, Richard. It was, uh, you're, you're, I, you're in I, I, was, I was so excited. I mean, look at their, their hats run, I mean, in the thousands. And, and I'll tell you, they, they came and I told them what my budget was and our budget. And, uh, and they deal with, you know, Westworld. They deal with all the Clint's movies and they deal with, uh, with all the Silverados, all the, uh, I mean, those movies, um, that dealt with, uh, Shit. Um, and so I mean, it was Stan kind of Laurel's hat. hat. Stan Laurel's hat. Yeah. Um, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's totally cool. Yeah. And now they've made so, Richard Grieco's hat. Which but is how so great cool. they were! They were so gracious and only charged me a certain amount, um, and uh, just for like you know, um, we'll be happy to do it for you, and, and we're, we're, we're a fan and or whatever, and and. Uh, so I was, I was like, just so excited and, and and lucky as shit. I can't wait to go on fucking set and show them. Look, this is what a fucking hat should look like. <laughs> <laughs> you start shooting on uh, Monday, yeah? Monday, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we're super excited because uh, I kind of told everybody what you said, uh, which is that you're. You're gonna do some cool shit from set for us for the Indie Brigade. So oh yeah, That'll be we're fun. all very excited. Be there. Fun. 
We've been talking tonight, guys. We've been talking tonight with Andre Gower and Ryan Lambert, um, myself, David Madison, and Joe Risley have been speaking with these gentlemen about the Monster Squad, a film that they were both in, and a documentary called Wolfman's Gotten Arts. And we've been talking a lot about the nostalgia of films. Um, I was mistaken about the year that uh, Monster Squad came out. It came out in 87. And um, there's a certain nostalgia uh, that, you know, and a certain, certain set of maybe a perfect storm of ingredients that have classified Monster Squad as a cult film over time. Uh, and one of the biggest pieces of street cred to a bunch of uh, horror geeks um, like all of us when we were kids growing up that has carried over with such powerful uh, powerful memories. People remember where they were when they saw Monster Squad, who took them, what was happening, you know, and it's interesting because um, Andre brought up the good point that, uh, you know, that his perception of a cult film, he believes, is that it's different for everybody, and I agree with that. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because the term cult film doesn't certainly imply that. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering, you know, what you guys' take is on that. Um, maybe start with uh, maybe start with Michael. And, you know, what, what's a cult film to you, Michael, um, as somebody who's been in, in this business at, at the level that, that you have worked in this business and continue to work in this business? What's a cult film to you? Well, you know, I think a little bit of the definition has shifted, and I think I agree that it's a bit individualistic uh, to some degree, but I think that in essence, you have such a, a dedicated audience uh, that know the film so well inside and out. Um, and it's a bit more than a fan, which I always think is a bit broad. And uh, yeah, I'm a fan of that movie or this movie, but I think a cult film is, I would call it a hyper dedicated fan in that sense. And it's kind of like, uh, uh, there's certain films that I think might become cult that like to me are like World War II films, but because of the longevity attached to these films being much older films that, um, you know, you know them or you don't. And, and God knows, maybe in the last 15 years, my, my, my son uh, knows these World War II films because I said, well, you could either watch it or shut up. So, you know... <laughs> This is what you're going to do. <laughs> and uh, so he and I would watch The Dirty Dozen or The Great Escape or, um, you know, Where Eagles Dare or um, Ooh, yeah. or um, um, what's the one is Paris Burning or The Train mm -hmm. with Burt Lancaster. And so you start to watch these kind of films and I could reel off entire scenes over a period of time. And... Um, so I think it's that hyper dedicated fan and, and unique to Monster Squad, I tend to think is what's interesting because of the horror genre, that's an even more intense fan base because you could put in, you know, a film that's pretty poorly made in a lot of ways, but it's got some of the most cool, authentic elements that resonate with a dedicated fan. And I think Andre hit on a number of those and so did Ryan, where the expectations are totally fulfilled for that fan. And I can't, I really think it comes down to uh, authenticity, that you really have a vision, not a committee of idiots, just saying, take this thing out of the movie, you know, this won't go to the quadrant or any of this bullshit. I think it's really about somebody who says, I got a vision. And um, so that's to me kind of the, uh, the sense of a cult film. And I think it's a little, um, you know, it sways with the, the genre and the instance and individual a little. Interesting answer. Richard, what's a cult film to you? What is the definition of cult films to you? Um, it's funny because a lot of cult films didn't do well at the box office. They became bigger like 5, 10, 15 years down the road. It's almost linear to like, um, like movie stars that were gone too soon. You know, mm. they become cult figures that you want more of it. Um, um, like Monster Squad, I saw it in theaters, um, and uh, but it wasn't out long. Um, and um, and I went through that with a books could kill, you know. Um, so I think it's the same kind of uh, scenario when 
something's out. And then it's funny when it has traction because it was really good and it had certain things and elements in it that were like so different for the time. Um, and like what he said, um, if it was in 97, came out, I don't know if it had the same kind of impact. Mm-mm. It would now. Or ma- imagine doing it like now. Imagine doing it like 2020. It would just be, you know, you just couldn't do it. So it's funny how it's caught in a time capsule that's been carried over and like people can now open it that were fans of it back then and kind of give to the people that didn't know about it back then and that makes it kind of like a, a almost like a new film again and that's where the, the the autobiography thing comes out or the biography or documentary comes out and uh it's an interesting kind of pathos of how that interjects between the two between cult and a, and a monster hit because mm-hmm. a lot of monster hit movies you don't remember but you can remember scenes from monster squad you can remember scenes from other movies like mirror dark and, and some other movies you're talking about yet maybe they didn't make you know, $180 million at the box office, you know? So that's the uh, interesting conundrum there that, that uh, pivots from being a movie and a cult movie, I think. It's funny you should say that, Richard. What's that? It's funny you should say that, Richard, because Endgame, which came out, I guess, just last year, is one of Mm -hmm. the biggest box office hits of all time, if not the biggest box office hit of all time. I really can't, focus on any part of that film that touched me in any kind of way that I remember it. It kind of all of those MCU movies kind of blend into each other. There's those those enormous kind of circus films, uh, a mm-hmm. theme park film like Martin Scorsese said, they're wonderful and they're made with the sole purpose of entertaining the masses, but they never really ever touch anybody on any kind of real level. I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. I definitely don't get any kind of uh, emotional sustenance or identification with them. And there's just something removed when they try and take these like superheroes and give them these carefully attributed flaws with some kind of, I don't know, plan to evoke emotional uh, connectivity, but it just doesn't work for me. And it's just really kind of fascinating because I think that whole universe just, um, I've seen a few of them, maybe four or something like that. But um, I prefer something else that's a little more, um, that has real touchstones, authentic touchstones, not a heavily glossy manufactured production pipeline. And that's all I, that's what I get out of that. Right? The, the, problem with that the problem with that is, and I, I agree with you, for sure, is that um, they're not, I mean, yes, we were children when, you know, comics and we, before they made all these films and da, 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 we saw that stuff. Those films are kind of made for kids now. They're for children. Yeah. Everyone's screaming about Wonder Woman online. I'm like, you're 45 year old single male living in your mom's basement screaming about <laughs> Wonder Woman. Like they literally didn't make that movie for you. Like that wasn't for you. Like that was for little girls, for like girl power, and like you know, you know, it, it, it's so it's hard for us to say things like you know, will those things become cult films? You know, we don't know. Star Wars was the biggest thing in the world when I was six years old. Uh, I mean, it was a phenomenon, obviously. And uh, you know, maybe when those kids grow up and they're like in their thirties, forties, like remember Endgame? Oh my God, like that was the biggest thing ever. They loved it. They had all the toys and they had all the things and now the DC universe is over, you know, 40 years from now, whatever, we don't know. So that's what I'm, I think I said that earlier about time will tell what makes something a sort of cult-ish in a way. I know that that's like the biggest thing in the world and it made like a trillion dollars and it doesn't like, you know, compare to the Monster Squad or something like that. But at the same time, it's like whatever like the feeling is in your heart when you're a child and then you grow up and remember things, I think that's kind of what makes something kind of culty anyway, at least to yourself. I I worked just, no matter how big box office success it was, you know, I still uh, have like memories of my, like, you know, Star Wars is a whole nother animal now, but like when I was a kid, there was a period after Re- Return of the Jedi, maybe three or four years after Jedi, it was kind of over. And like, 
then like maybe 20 years down the road, we would say, hey, remember that toy from Star Wars? Even though it was like the biggest thing ever, it was still like this, it was still a secret club. If you had like the Greedo that you got in the mail that like had the different pants on than the one they put out in the stores or something. There's just like, there's always weird little parallels things with, with those kind of stuff. So, well, you know, I, I think know. Ryan hit on something interesting about a cult is that it's kind of like uh, whatever subject you want to undertake woodworking, let's say for Cameron or painting with Richard and, you know, et cetera. And when you start talking about the subject, you know, right away, if somebody really knows what they're talking about or not, or they're trying to fake their way into the tribe. And, you know, for me, World War II movies, you want to talk about the T-34 versus the Panther versus the Sherman, let's go. You know, and um, <laughs> but it's that it's that interesting qualifier that do you really know your shit because you put in the time, and uh, like what Ryan was saying about the uh, the toys, you know that becomes part of the cult. A membership fee is the knowledge base and the enthusiasm, mm -hmm. and I think that's definitely one of the, the thresholds for ascribing a cult or um, uh, a classic kind of cult movie. It's I'm the sorry, street David, cred. what were you trying to say? It's the well, street cred. Yeah, yeah. I, I think in 1931, when Frankenstein and Dracula, the original Universal Pictures, uh, came out, no one intended for those pictures to be the films that we would be talking about in 2021. They were probably thinking about other films that were made in 1931 that would have more substance to them. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I, I, I would believe that 40 years from now, or like Andre brought up earlier, well, I mean, uh, 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 the people would probably still be more enamored with films like The Monster Squad because their dads passed it on to kids. And and things like Endgame are just going to kind of disappear, like uh, the big films of, of those generations did. And the iconic films are still around. Yeah, I, I, won't, I won't disagree. I think that just because I've had about seven, you know, podcast fun times in the last couple of weeks where they've said the exact same thing. So it's, uh, it, I kind of stay out of the kind of conversation where they say monster squad by itself, or either films like monster squad that kind of either have, like George said, the same authenticity or the heart in the story or the characters. I think it's the archetypes, the situations, all the combinations of that's in the story, including the, the, the family, the, the group of kids that bond together. Cause you know, we're all, you know, getting middle-aged, you know, dudes in America here, and we all remember the fun times we had in the backyard or the, the field or the woods with our friends. And that's what make you who you are. Th that never leaves your DNA. And I think movies like that last, whether it's Monster Squad or something other, that will transcend decades. And like Endgame, I mean, they brought up the same thing. You know, they were bringing up Civil War, they bring up Endgame. They're like, they're great, made a bazillion dollars that summer. And no one's going to be downloading Endgame in 40 years because uh, oh, there's no reason to. But we will download, um, you know, Mega Casablanca Force. or Force, Force 10 <laughs> from Navarone. Oh, uh, yeah, there you, you go. Know, <laughs> you know, see, you're, you're, you're my guy. You, already, you hit on my stuff, Michael. Uh, All right. There yeah. we go. Force you know, yeah. it, I bring up the, you know, for different stuff, you know, mm -hmm. either World War II or that time, not just classic movies, but what was going on. But. Yeah, I don't. I don't think the current, uh, you know, comic book movies that are huge and splashy, uh, you know, have that longevity. I, what I wish would happen with comic book movies is they would stay true to sort of kind of comic book characters where they're very deep and very archetypal and very impactful as individuals that always have a struggle or an issue or whatever. Some of them are kind of, you know, they're kind of rubber stamped out. But if you did, you know, they tried to do that with Batman you know, all the Batman movies, which is, yeah. you know, the, you know, the darkest individual of cool heroes and they do an okay job, but I'm with you on the kind of super splashy. They're wonderful to see. And look at all the toys we get to bring to bear to make, you know, Iron Man fly through the air, or blow up Thanos. And they're fun for about the three hours that you watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, guys, I think that we could have an entire conversation about this. But we yeah, are, move on. <laughs> we, no, I, we're, we're coming to the end here. So I want to uh, I want to take a minute and I want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. This is a big moment for us tonight. Uh, it is the season premiere of our sixth season doing this. 
Um, and uh, it's just an honor to have both of you guys join us and be part of the Indie Brigade. Um, Michael, Richard, uh, just I'm so proud and happy that you guys are here and part of the Indie Brigade. Oh, absolutely. And I love you guys. And um, Andre, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and an honor to speak with you tonight. I'm looking for, I'm hoping that you will consider yourself welcomed into the brigade and that you'll come back um, often. So, oh man, this is rad. Just hit me up. Uh, this was this was fun. Like you said, you know, I think all of us can sit around and break our jaws talking about stuff that <laughs> I mean, I think some people yeah. care about, but uh well, and that's me started on Force Ten from now on. Now. You know, uh, well, that was gotta, my jam. I, I watched all those movies with my uncle. I gotta say one thing. I know Andre's thinking of Barbara Bach in the bathtub in Force Ten Navarone. I, I'm not thinking of anything, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to know you. Please come back. Let's continue these conversations. This is what the Indie Brigade is about, and these are the kind of conversations that everybody in the Indie Brigade loves to uh, be a part of. You know, I mean, I, I often say that. Um, a lot of the stuff that a lot of us in the industry have learned um, it just came from sitting at tables listening to people like us talk. And now we're people that there's a whole bunch of folks that love to sit and listen to us talk about this type of stuff. So I really do hope that you guys will come back, uh, you know, often and continue these conversations with us. Um, Michael, Richard, uh, see you next Friday. And you got it. Um, David. <laughs> I love you, brother. Thank you for being you part of everything. Joe, I love you. And I yeah, love um, you as well. But before we go, I, I got to put Andre and I got to put Ryan on the spot. Oh, uh oh. Okay. Bye, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Um, the Andre, Irish goodbye. There it is. Where can, where can folks find you on uh, social media and where can they find Wolfman's Nards and. Well, you can uh, you can find me personally on uh, Instagram at Andre Gower Official and on Twitter at Andre Gower. Uh, please follow me, and you can link to stuff to to Wolfman's Got Nards. But uh, the documentary has got its own handles, which is at the Squad Doc. Uh, that's the two D's in the middle at the Squad Doc on both Twitter and Instagram, and it has a YouTube page with some fun videos and trailer and, and, and link to the website. Um, yeah, please follow. You know, if you're in U.S. and Canada, that's where it's released now on your VOD platform of choice. Uh, you can also order the Blu-ray, you know, via Amazon.com or a couple of the retailers. Uh, people are really liking the Blu-ray. I think that's doing better than uh, we anticipated. Uh, but physical media, people love it. So, um, and, and for your international listeners, if you have anybody overseas right now, uh, we are currently working on the international release. So just hang in there and it'll, uh, it won't be too much longer. Awesome. That is awesome. I uh, greatly appreciate that. And we will hopefully see you next time. Andre, do yeah. you have a Facebook uh, page? Uh, I do have a Facebook page, but my Facebook page I'm rarely on, and I don't know why, but I slugged that for, like, people I'm related to and went to, like, six. No, I mean... <laughs> but I'm, I'm on Facebook every once in a while, so what, what, what can I connect with on Facebook for you? No, I'm, no, I, I, well, it's the only social media I'm on, so I was going to send you. Oh, well, I'll, I'll connect I... with you on that. That's totally fine. Oh, but I'm, oh, I'm related to you now anyway. Uh, yeah. You mentioned more Eagles there. I mean, come on. It's, uh, you see, I you get know, shot down immediately with these guys. It's like, boom, Joe Richley, who the fuck? You know, it's funny, Joe, back when you were on the top and Ryan was in the middle and uh, Rico was on the bottom, it was clearly the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could change that around a little again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan, we're going to put you on the spot now, buddy. Where can people find you on social media? What are you working on? What do you want to promote? Uh, I uh, Instagram is fine. Ryan Lambert 111. Uh, that's pretty much it as far as social media goes. Uh, I also am about to put out another record with my band. Uh, I, I'm in LA now, but I lived in San Francisco for 15 years and my, uh, my two bands there, uh, the, the new album should be out next, the uh, next couple months, maybe three months. The band's called Kill Moi. So you can just do social media. You can find me on Instagram. I'll promote the shit out of that at some point. And, uh, you'll find that, uh, other than that, I'm just kind of sitting on my, uh, couch 
watching films and uh, trying to stay safe. Awesome. Hey, hey that's, that's a sweet to... amp back there, dude. Is that an orange? This one? <laughs> yeah, that's the little orange practice amp that Andre bought me for Hanukkah. And uh, <laughs> on top of my actual... Fender. Fender, uh, Is that a ukulele? Fender basement. What? Is that a ukulele? Yeah, I just got it. It's, it's my new... Uh, is that a watermelon? watermelon? <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's not tuned. Oh, is... I, play... I also have. I'm left-handed, so I haven't uh, tuned in left-handed yet. But you know, it'll be soon. We will use that soon. <laughs> Excellent. That is awesome. And I'm I'm just gonna go through Greco and Mandeville real fast. Let's see. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Got to go with the guy with the expensive hat. I'm sorry, Mike. Okay. <laughs> Grico, tell us a little bit about um, what uh, what you got coming up, what you're going to work on. Um, I know that uh, you said that you were going to do uh, do an appearance next Friday from set and maybe send some videos and stuff to us to put out to the brigade. Um, but uh, once you, what can you tell people about the project that you're going to do? Um, it's, uh, it's called Night of the Tommy Knockers. It's with the Mahal Brothers. Um, um, uh, me, Robert Sardo, I think and Tom Sizemore, Jessica Morris, um, and uh, it's basically a, a sci-fi western. Um, not like uh, Cowboys and Aliens, it's more um, explicit to like creatures and stuff like that. But, uh, Thank God. It's a, it's a fun uh, ride, and, and it's authentic western stuff with, with the, with the uh, kind of monster zombie slash creature um, um, thing to it so it, it's, a, it's actually a really good script i was really pleasantly surprised and pleased with it so i'm looking forward to it awesome yeah we've talked a lot about it and I, i'm excited for you so and i know everybody uh, here is excited to see you from set and stuff and michael you've got the creative explorer coming to the indie brigade indeed i do in fact i've got my first interview done it was uh with one of the um actors in my series here called Beer Pong Coach. And so we had a lot of fun doing that. And um, I'm gonna interview more people, bring it there and how the series was made. I have uh, 10 episodes, 12, 14 minutes kind of thing. And um, that's one thing I want to elucidate with people is how to construct their own series and think like a big picture, let's say line producer UPM, so it's all organized. So. Uh, and uh, my film Into the Flame sold at the AFM and went up on Amazon last month. And I've got a couple things in either Australia or Morocco that seem to have things more under control with the uh, present environment for some projects to uh, shoot direct. So awesome. Got some things cooking there, and you know, just enough to stay out of jail, as my dad used to say. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you guys all for being here tonight for this amazing uh season six premiere thank you everybody i appreciate and it and i'm gonna start dropping you guys out again thank you and you know the guys who denied me a friend request hit me up good night <laughs> good night <laughs> wow night guys <laughs> That was actually busting balls, by the way, but all right, it's you and I. Great show. Awesome show. Yeah, well done. Whew. Haven't had that much fun in a while. Yeah. Well, everybody, are you ready, by the way? Am I ready? I'm always ready. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for sticking with us for six seasons. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, I can't thank you all enough. From the bottom of my heart, uh, I love absolutely every one of you. And I thank you so much for being with us, for sticking with us, for spending your Friday nights with us, um, for, for letting us help you get through the, the, the COVID, getting through the quarantine. Um, hopefully we've helped you stay sane. I know you all have helped me stay sane. So thank you so much for everything. Uh, thank you, David, who's no longer on the screen. Thank you, Joe, for everything. Thank you, uh, everybody in the Indie Brigade, Lance, Sam. Thank you, Gunny. Thank you, uh, to Terry. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you to my beautiful wife, Rebecca. Thank you to everybody uh, from the bottom of my heart. If I didn't name you, it's not personal. It's just there's literally too many. So 
Uh, thank you, everybody. And as usual, and as always, fuck off till next time.